Hello, my name is Jacob, and I'm a Norse pagan, and welcome to the first episode of the First God Week, where I'm going to take a whole week of episodes to discuss one deity at a time, and this week we're going to start with the Thunderer himself, Thor. Now, if you want to know more about this series, how it's going to be kind of set up, and the future deities we may be talking about, please check out the announcement video I made about it um, to find out more information. Otherwise, I want to dig right into it. That way, you can watch it, get all this boring stuff out of the way, so we can get to the fun stuff, like talking about how to actually honor Thor in a modern world. Um, but it is very important to understand source material. It is important to understand how many inconsistencies we have in this faith. Um, I think it's important to read as many sources as possible, to watch as many videos as possible. That way you can have a list of all the things we know, and then you can decipher what is best used for your personal practice. Um, so without further ado, let us hop into the actual written sources and the actual facts of Thor. So starting with the Poetic Edda, uh, which is going to be our primary source for most of this. Um, most of the Thor stories do take place in the Poetic Edda, um, a few of which take place in the Prose Edda as well. Um, but starting with the Poetic Edda, there are 15 god stories um, related to the gods, elves, whatnot, at least listed in the Jackson Crawford translation. Um, so of those 15 stories, seven of those involve Thor. Four of those stories also involve him as the main character, which is fascinating because I find that he, at least in my personal ear to the ground in the Norse pagan community, is not that honored of a god in the sense that I don't find many people saying, oh, he's my patron, or oh, I want to commit more time to learning Thor. Maybe it's because there's not as much mystery around him. I'm not quite sure. We'll explore that in the, the future videos in this series. Um, but yes, I have listed for all the stories that he is in within the Poetic Edda. So I'm just going to go through those stories, um, give you a summary of kind of what happens um, and what we can learn from those stories. Starting at the top, which is ironic because it's also the end, is Volispa. Um, in stanza 54 um, is Thor's part in Ragnarok, where Thor will be killed by the World Serpent. Um, so this is interesting because it's your first four way into the Poetic Edda. You both have the creation of everything and then the end of everything as well, including the death of Thor. Um, so there's not too much to be read into this. This is something that I find is more common knowledge. Uh, if, anyone, if anything is known about Thor outside of the Marvel movies, um, it is that he is killed by the World Serpent, or at least his, uh, his beef with the World Serpent. The next story in the Poetic Edda that Thor makes an appearance is Grimnismal, um, and it's in stanza 23. It's pretty short. This story is about Odin and Frigg having an argument, um, and Odin eventually like disguising himself to go prove his side of the argument um, and listing a bunch of facts. Now, before I say Thor's Hall's name, remember I'm a filthy American, I speak filthy American English, and I apologize for the uh, any mis uh, mispronunciation, for any mispronunciation, I can barely speak my own damn language, um, so I do apologize. I am not by any means trying to take any accreditation away from Iceland, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, all these countries that can pronounce these much better than I will. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm trying my best. So Thor's Hall is Bilskinir, um, and it said, Bilskinir is the most spacious hall in all of Asgard, with 540 halls for accommodations of the thralls, according to Norse mythology, the Norse mythology book I have here. But um, what I see in the Poetic Edda is that it has 540 rooms, and it is the largest of the halls of Asgard. Um, so again, not too much we can take from this um, in itself, besides the fact that Thor has a hall, it's large, um, and you know he lives a large life. Um, so the next story is the first story we see him as a main character. Um, this also ha so happens to be my favorite story in the Poetic Edda, and that's Harvest the Old. Um, this is the story of Thor and Odin in disguise as Greybeard, arguing across a river or a fjord um, as Thor comes back from a recent campaign um, against the giants. And so there's a lot of insults thrown between the two, which is, I mean, some of them are quite aggressive, um, considering his father and son yelling at each other. Um, but the things to learn here is that he is very protective of his family because the moment that Odin goes after his wife um, and his you know extended friend groups and friend, uh, family, he gets very protective of them. It seems he cares less for himself in this situation, more for his family's sake. Now he does get quite mad at Odin um, for all the insults and it becomes more of a boasting match than anything else about halfway through. Um, it eventually ends in sort of a stalemate as Thor has to go all the way around. Um, but an amazingly entertaining story. If you haven't checked it out, 
um, please re-harvest the old. It's absolutely amazing. It's short and it's just it's just pure fun. So this next one is another story where he is the main character. Um, this one I definitely apologize for the pronunciation. It's Himskida. Hims Himskida. It is Himskida. Fida. Himis Himiskida. That is my 15th take, and I think I did okay. So this story is um, another well-known story. I believe it is in uh, Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology, if I'm not mistaken. It's the story of Thor and Tyr going off to take back the largest cauldron in order to brew beer for a feast at Aegir's Hall. Now, this story is very well known because this is also the story where Thor goes to fish out the world serpent. Um, so he uses an ox head to fish out um, the world serpent and it ends up dragging the boat along with it. Obviously doesn't end up catching it, um, but it is a you know quite a fantastical story about him doing this. Um, and then this is also a story where he is tested by Hymir, which is the um, which is the giant who ended up having the cauldron. Um, and Thor has to pass this test in order to get it back. And that's to break an indestructible cup. Um, and the answer ends up being, um, now Thor does try to smash it with his brute strength, but he ends up on smashing it on the head of Hymir himself, um, as was suggested by one of his, um, his lovers, concubines, something like that. Um, so he ends up breaking it um, and winning back the cauldron. <laughs> on the way back, he ends up getting, they, uh, him and Tyr end up getting chased down by the giants. Um, he ends up killing them all. Um, so I don't know how much there is to read into this, but it's a it's a wonderful story once again. It's a very entertaining story, and I know we have, um, there is archaeological evidence, which I'll put up if I can find it, um, of a depiction of this event of him fishing for the world servant with an ox head. Um, so it's something that we know is pretty prevalent. Of course, most of the information we do have recorded, at least in the form of Poetica and the Prose Edda, we, for the most part, can determine that they were written down by Christians, so it's sometimes hard to determine what is real um, and what can be, you know, what has been influenced by Christianity, and of course what is consistent across the board, because you might find something written about Thor in one small area um, and then find something completely different. As we will get to here in a moment, you'll find that there's so many inconsistencies. So to see that the story exists and there's also an engraving that exists that also talks about this makes me feel pretty good and hopefully everyone else pretty good that this story is actually something that was told in the pre-Christian Scandinavian times. So the next story that features Thor, not as the main character, um, but he is prevalent in it um, and, and it comes in in the end, is Lokasena, um, which this is the story where Loki is passing insults to everyone, um, you know, all the gods. This is one where we see many of the gods listed by name. Um, and they keep on saying, oh, you better you stop this before Thor comes back, you'll whip your head off, all these things. And of course, Thor does come back um, and, you know, once again, shows that protective instinct of, you know, well, one going after Loki for all these insults. I don't, th I don't think there's too much that can be read into this story besides the fact that, once again, Thor is very protective. And, you know, this is just another interesting part of the Ragnarok cycle, so to speak. Um, the next story that Thor, once again, is the main character of is Thirmskida. This one, again, is one of the more known stories for anyone that knows anything about Norse mythology. You probably know the famous story of Thor in the wedding dress. Um, so I don't find that the story has too much to look into as far as, like, is there any revealing things about Thor besides it's funny? I mean, this is a funny story. This was written to be a funny story. This was told as a funny story of this big, burly, red, bearded warrior having to wear a wedding dress to get back his hammer, which was stolen from him. Um, so just a really funny tale. Um, you know, it ends very abruptly. They have all this buildup of him talking to Freya and Loki to try to get this hammer back. And, you know, Freya, you know, actually getting Freya to marry this giant so he can actually get his, his hammer back. Um, but eventually he just dresses as Freya. Um, and goes to marry the giant and of course once he finally gets his hand on Mjolnir um, he then kills all the giants while wearing the wedding dress. Again, hilarious story um, even today. Yes, I don't think there's too much to look into as far as like the worship aspect but again, just a fun tale that we have recorded um, about Thor. Hopefully you're seeing a theme here of what we seem to have about Thor. Um, so the final story that we have um, that features Thor, once again, he is featured as the main character. Because uh, once again, there are four stories where he is featured as the main character in the Poetic Edda. Um, and this one is actually one of my personal favorites as well, which is Elvis Maul. So this one's interesting. Um, it's I would call it one of the more lesser known poems. It's something that people don't bring up very often, um, but is an interesting aspect of Thor because 
Quite frankly, if you replace Thor in this story with Odin, I think it makes more sense. But it's interesting that it is. So this story is about the dwarf that shows up at Thor's home to try to take his daughter, um, his daughter's hand in marriage, and Thor doesn't allow it, and so he ends up getting into a wit contest with this all-wise character. Um, so this is actually a great mythology exploration. It shares a lot of the mythology and the landscapes and the understandings, and it's actually just a really fun poem. Um, highly recommend reading it. Um, and this is also where we see Thor trick the dwarf into staying up all night and seeing the sunrise and turning the dwarf to stone. Sound familiar, Lord of the Rings fans? This is the story that influenced The Hobbit, uh, where Gandalf um, and Bilbo trick the uh, trolls to staying up all night and getting hit by the morning sun and turning into stone. Um, so, it's interesting because we always considered Gandalf to be this um, Odin type figure and here we have that story actually coming from a Thor story and this goes into a longer reaching idea that I found within other sources that suggest that Thor is more like Odin than we give him credit for um, that uh, even in Sweden I saw reference this is very um, this came from this book uh, uh, Tales of Norse Mythology um, that Thor actually was known as the Wideburn Hat God uh, in Sweden, and that um, the Wideburn Hat is associated with storms and Thor um, at the same time. Um, so this idea that Thor is, I mean, he's the son of Odin, so it makes sense that one of the traits he gets is some form of wisdom. Um, and most of the stories we see him as this, you know, brutish character, uh, but we see this more as the, the wise man, the wanderer. I mean, Thor, half the time, he's away from Asgard. Um, and so, again, really interesting story. So that kind of ends the poetic Edda, at least the stories that we have within it. So going through the prose Edda, there are a few stories that feature Thor. He is mentioned throughout the poetic Edda. Um, it would take far too long and it's really not even worth it to discuss all the times he is mentioned because there's so many loose times. Um, but there are several really prominent stories that we probably heard as well. You also find these featured in Norse mythology by Neil Gaiman, uh, which is a much better to read, way to read them honestly. Um, because the prose edit is an annoyingly hard book to read. It's boring. I don't trust it. Um, but, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of the stories we have now. I know I can be hard on it sometimes, but it just has a stink to it. And it's just, it's hard to navigate. It's hard to read. Not a big fan. Anyways, the first main story featured in um, the prose edda is uh, the tale of Utgard and Loki. Um, so this is the story of Thor and Loki traveling together. Now, of course, this is interesting because um, I think this is where a lot of the Marvel influences, at least the movies, come into play, where they seem to be a little bit more friends, sort of. But, um, you know, they are traveling together, seeming to get along most of the time. It's an entertaining story. I really enjoy it, um, even within the prose edit to some extent. Uh, but this, the story also has multiple layers. It really is uh, divided into three main parts. Um, the first is which is Loki and Thor traveling and eventually meeting a um, small peasant family that they end up spending the night with, which is interesting because God's just traveling around, find a small family, and they said, hey, can we spend the night? Um, as part as the hospitality aspect of this, um, Thor ends up killing his two goats, which can be resurrected every day, um, to eat that night for dinner. Uh, one of the children ends up like taking one of the bones when Thor resurrects um, the, the goats the next day. Um, they are One of them has a limp, so he knows that someone tampered with the bones. And so um, they end up having to take the child with them on the journey. Um, once again, this is something I found in Tales of Norse Mythology. It seems like there are like murmurings that this is something that was common, is that Thor would take um, human companions along with him, um, that he tr did treat them well, um, and uh, was quite known for being the god of the peasantry. Um, so they end up taking this child along with them on the journey. Um, and they end up, the second part of the story is running into a uh, giant named, named Skrymir. Um, now, Thor wants to kill this giant, but it's a very boastful giant. It, you know, says, you know, Thor can't kill him, blah, blah, blah. They end up traveling together, and Thor tries to kill him three times and fails. Again, this is kind of a funny story, because every time Thor tries to kill him, um, you know, the, uh, the Skrymir just wakes up like, oh, an acorn fell on my head, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> I picture him as like this job of the hut. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, you know, just every time that uh, he fails. Um, and it kind of goes nowhere. Like, Skrymir eventually just kind of leaves them. It's weird. Uh, and then you have the, uh, when they actually get to meet Odgar and Loki, um, and they have the contest of wills. 
uh, two of which being Thor's, one of which being Loki's. Um, Thor's are quite interesting. Uh, Thor has to drink from an endless horn um, and drain it dry as a contest of his ability to drink. And so um, this is where he starts drinking from the horn. Um, and he drinks so much that he actually ends up lowering the sea levels because the horn itself, the, the trickery behind it, um, is that it's attached to the ocean. And so, you know, to actually drink it would be drink the ocean, and that's why it's a test. Uh, but he ends up drinking it so much that there, it causes a deficit in the ocean, which is the story of how we got our tides. Really fascinating story. And then the other story, well, Loki's little part in it is he has an eating contest and, and fails. Um, but Thor also fails his next challenge, which is to wrestle somebody and to fight somebody. Um, and go to Loki says, oh, fight this old woman. And Thor laughs, says, oh, you can't throw this old woman at me, blah, blah, blah. Ends up fighting and loses because you cannot fight old age because the woman herself was actually a resemblance of old age. Um, so, of course, this, you know, you know, angers Loki, angers Thor uh, because they um, were bested by these challenges. And so they leave. Um, Thor is really angry and thinks, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to kill these, you know, these giants because that's what Thor does. And so he turns around, but um, Odgo to Loki and his kingdom are gone. Um, so a really fascinating tale, a tale with a lot of layers, which is why I do enjoy it. But once again, I think you should read it in Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman. That is the majority of the written sources. There are some more in the prose edda, but it's mostly small little murmurings. Um, like one is Hrugnir, like he kills Hrugnir. Um, this is like, um, kind of talk about my Volknut video a little bit, um, is that um, Hrugnir was a giant. Um, that said he couldn't be killed. Um, he also challenged Odin to a race, loses, um, and then Thor, like, you know, wants to go duel him, and Thor basically, like, one-shots him and kills him. Um, and this is the story of Krugnir, um, and he ends up taking um, Krugnir's horse as a prize and gives it to Magni, his son. And of course, this, and of course there's the story of how Mjolnir was forged, which you can actually read in uh, Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology as well, in a more modern language, highly recommend it. Um, but you'll see that story featured there as well. And it always seems like, no matter what, what, what no matter what story is happening, um, whether it's in the prose or the poetic era, Thor always seems to be floating around. He's at least mentioned once or twice, like even within the small, uh, the miniature Volospa, I forget the name off the top of my head, but the smaller Volospa, um, which features more of Frey as a character, Thor is mentioned like briefly. Um, I didn't add it into this list just because it was such a brief of mentioning. Uh, but Thor is a very prominent god to be mentioned in any story. Um, and it seems like, I mean, I would argue that Thor is pretty darn tied with Odin for the most written about deity that we have currently. Um, but that does not mean we don't have misconceptions. Um, so one of the things that really made me tear my hair out when re researching into Thor was his children. Now, I don't care about this as much as a practitioner of the faith, but it's still, as a mythology aspect, it is really, really annoying. So, let me give you a breakdown. Okay, so most of us know that Thor is married to Sif, right? That is his wife. Um, there are accounts that he had a lover. This lover's name was Einsaxa or Yarnsaxa. Uh, meaning iron stone or iron dagger, iron sword, um, and this. But weirdly enough, this woman was a giant, and so it's weird. But anyway, so there's you know Sif that most of us know for sure. There's iron, uh, iron Saxa or yarn Saxa uh, that seems to be possible as well. Um, and then there are the three main children. Most people know Magni and Loki, his two sons. Once again, I apologize for pronunciations, but there's also Thruder or Thruder. Um, she is his daughter. Um, now, I have also seen accounts of Lorid or Lorith as one of his daughters as well, but I have basically found nothing on her. It was written in the Tales of Norse Mythology book here. Uh, the main sources I used for this were obviously Prose Edda, Poke Edda, uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, Norse Mythology, Tales of Norse Mythology by Helen Gerber, and The Norse Myths, A God to Guide to Gods and Heroes by uh, Caroline Larrington. So yeah, those were all my sources. That's where I'm getting a lot of these from. And each one says something slightly different about Thor, um, at least about his marriage and about his children. So let's break this down. All right, so normally the most common thing I have found is that Thor is married to Sif, who bore him Maggie and Mothi and Thruther. I have also read accounts that says that Sif only bore him Maggie and Mothi. 
um, and that I'm Saxa for him Fruther, which would make sense because Fruther is a, considered a giantess, so it makes sense that she would come from Iron Saxa or Iron, Sa or Iron Saxa. And then I've also seen accounts that say Iron Saxa bore him Magni and that Sif bore him Modi. Ah, ah. Okay, and then I've also seen accounts that Iron Saxa bore him Magni and Modi and that Sif only bore him Fruther. Ah, so this is where I started to lose my mind a little bit because it seems like no matter what I read them in, some, everything said something different. Um, whether it was the Poetic Edda, the Prose Edda, Tales of Norse Mythology, or the Norse Myths, the Guides of Gods and Heroes, they all said something different. But, I think what can be said is that Thor was married to Sif for sure, that he may or may not have had an affair or a love interest in Jan Saxa, but it doesn't seem to be very long, and then at best it bore him one child. It makes sense that we would be Thruther, who would be considered the giantess. Again, I have a problem with this theory and this the, this idea because Thor hates giants. They're his mortal enemy. They, he hates them. He kills them on the regular. Why would he lie with one? And again, maybe this is coming from Odin. I'm not sure. I'm just here to present the facts to you. It's confusing, especially in the in the you know the marriage and in the children. But once again, I don't think this matters too much as people that want to follow him as a deity within Norse paganism. I don't think it should matter too much to figure out who he was actually fathers to, a father to, and married to. Um, from what I can deter from the Poetic Edda and other sources, it seems like that he was a very loyal husband um, when he was actually married to Sif. Again, not sure about this Yarn Saxa um, and whatnot, but unlike Odin, who definitely seemed to sleep around a lot. But Thor definitely seemed to be a very committed man, so he definitely seemed to be the man for marriage, if you want to look to as well, as long with Freyr. Um, but he seemed to be a good father, a good husband, a good son, um, a good man. Um, and once again, I've seen many mentionings of him being the common person's god, whereas Odin was more the king's god. Um, and, Thor, and Thor definitely earned these stripes because um, within history, he was actually the primary deity of both Norway and Iceland. Um, and that definitely had some prominence in Sweden as well. Um, so Thor being a prominent deity definitely helps in the creation of the Mjolnir as something that people wore. Um, I plan on doing a full Mjolnir video where I'll explore this more, but obviously many of us wear Mjolnirs around our necks to signify our Norse pagan religion. Um, and I think that fits very well considering that he is the god of the people. It would make sense that many of the people would wear one of his symbols, um, even going into today. Oh, all right, all right, I feel good. This was a lot of information. Um, I wanted to share it with you so that way you could have it all condensed in one video. What does all this mean as um, far as like history? It, it, seems like, it seems like Thor is one of the most consistent deities that we know. He is a very complex character. He's not one dimensional. If you just read one story, you'll find that maybe Thor is a very one dimensional character. I don't find this to be true. If you read all the stories that are written about him um, and all the information we have about him, I find him to be a very complex character um, that I think people need to follow more because he's the god of the people. He's not just the god of thunder, he's got the god of so much more. We can definitely determine that Thor was a strong god, um, a very masculine figure within the faith. Um, but one thing I do want to leave us on as well is it seems like he is also the comic relief of the faith at times, or at least in Norse mythology, uh, with the stories of Harvest the Old um, and within uh, Thnirmskvida. Uh, where he dresses in the um, the wedding dress. Um, and even Alvis Mall is a very entertaining story. Um, I would find that the most of the stories talked about where he is the main character are some of the most entertaining within the um, within the poetic Edda. Um, and even even the tale of Utgarda Loki is one of the most complex tales that we have. Um, so I think he's a god to be remembered, a god to be hailed. He was definitely very prominent in the pre-Christian Scandinavian times. And I do believe that he needs more attention now. Um, more people need to look for him. Um, a lot of people tend to look to Odin when they first get into this faith. Let me tell you, Odin ain't around that much. You know who's gonna be around a lot more? Thor. Um, I know in the past I've said that Thor is, you know, you feel him during thunderstorms, that's great, but you can fear him other times as well. 
But we're going to explore that in a different video more in depth. This was the written facts, at least within the books I have, um, the inconsistencies within the books I have, um, the stories that he's talked about in. So yeah, you have them as well. Um, the next video coming out in this God Week Studying Thor is going to break down the Marvel problem and why I think many people don't follow Thor in this modern world. So video coming out this Wednesday, please check it out. We're going to be breaking down the Marvel problem with Thor. And then later this week, I'm going to be releasing a video talking about the modern practice of venerating Thor, honoring Thor as a modern practitioner of this faith. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of, uh, of God Week. Um, I hope you enjoyed it with Thor. I hope to continue this series. If you enjoyed it, please let me know down below what other deities you would like me to talk about. Um, and until next time, until the hall,